Go ahead and find Romans chapter 15. We are making our way through the book of Romans, and uh, we'll be finished here in, in just a couple weeks. So we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 21 today. So if you have your copies of, copy of God's Word, go ahead and find Romans 15, 8 through 21. Now, as you turn there, I'll say, uh, when we bought the Oaks Church building, we inherited dozens of blueprints, faded blueprints from times past. And uh, we have great architects like uh, Steve and Greg who have taken those blueprints and looked over them. And, and, and part of understanding those blueprints was to understand the design of this building, uh, to, to get a grasp of the master plan and the way that things are laid out and the, how the joists run. We needed to see kind of the schematics behind the walls. And we began to dream. Uh, not because we just get excited about buildings. We begin to dream about hundreds of people worshiping this place. We begin to dream about, dream about classrooms where, you know, young children would meet Jesus and make friends. We begin to dream about how we can be a beacon of light in our city. And then we invited some architects to begin to dream with us. And so uh, we, we worked on this master plan of not only what the building could look like at the time we get into it, but as we continue to grow, what could it look like five years from now? What changes could we make? Where could we create room and more classrooms 10 years from now? We just began to dream and to master plan because we wanted a vision from the beginning of what could be now, of what already is, and where we're going. Now, I say that because in Romans 15, uh, particularly the first section, we get a picture of God's master plan throughout all eternity to bring people from every nation, tribe, and tongue to himself. Yes, God had a, a unique covenant relationship with Israel, and yet as his covenant people, they were designed to be a light for the whole world so that God's people would be made up of both Jews and Gentiles. And so what we will see today is God's eternal mission and then how we practically apply that just in our everyday lives. Because there is God's eternal mission and then there is the everyday mission of God that you and I live faithful to. So the main point for my text today is this, that God's eternal plan is to save people of every nation and to send us into the world to make him known. Now, since the beginning of chapter 14, Paul has been instructing the church in Rome on issues of unity. Uh, as I said before, there were a lot of Jews in the church, and there were a lot of Gentiles in the church. And so, uh, for those who are from a Jewish background, they had uh, very strong opinions on observing holy days and the dietary restrictions of Jewish law and uh, just kind of this aversion to eating any meat that would have been sacrificed by idols. And then you have Gentiles who who might not have shared the same sensitivity to those things. As we've walked through that over the past few weeks, we've called those matters of conscience, as Paul does in Romans 14. Uh, the weaker conscience is having more sensitivity to those things, and then having a strong conscience is, you know, understanding, hey, these things don't affect my standing with God, uh, so they're not really an issue to me. Now, these are non-essentials, so they are not a matter of spiritual maturity, but they are a test of unity in the church. And so Paul, once he gets to Romans 15, 7, says, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. How are you ultimately going to be unified in the church? It is to realize that the Son of God, eternal God, took on flesh and gave up his life for you. And if the Son of God has given up his own life to serve you, then you can set aside some of your preferences to pursue unity and to love your neighbor. And what we find as Paul continues is that he is grounding this understanding of unity and mutual love for one another in the eternal mission of God, saying this isn't just kind of to, to prevent conflict. This is to present evidence that it was always God's eternal plan to unite uncommon people to create a community of faith called the family of God. And so he's going to show us that by proving it through Old Testament scripture, and then he's going to kind of tell us the implications that that has on our everyday life. Uh, so I want to give you two vantage points in our time today of God's mission. And the first vantage point of God's mission is the eternal mission of God. 
So, so zooming up, looking kind of at the wide angle. This is the fisheye lens. We want the whole picture, the panoramic, eternal mission of God. Let's read verses 8 through 13. God's word says this. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Now let's pause there and just walk through this passage of Scripture together as we behold the eternal mission of God. Uh, Now we see from the very beginning in verse 8 that Christ became a servant for us. Christ is king. Christ is the primary agent of creation and yet humbles himself to become a servant. As Philippians 2 says, to the point even of death on the cross. And what did Jesus say in Mark 10, 45? For even the Son of Man came... Not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Consider how Christ has served you and let that be the fountain from which you draw the water needed to serve others. I recently read a story, and maybe, maybe you, you saw this in the news as well. There was this father that lived in San Diego, and his son um, was, was addicted to heroin, and his son ended up moving to Denver and, and living as a homeless man in downtown Denver. And this father just broken over uh, the state that his son found himself in. He moved to Denver, and he told his wife, he said, I I am going to go where my son is uh, and to become like my son is for for the sake of of drawing his back drawing him back and and hopefully saving his life. And so he he gets to Denver, he reaches out to this guy named Chris Connor, who was, you know, the kind of the leader of uh, homeless prevention and support in downtown Denver. And, you know, he he gets kind of a, a schedule of the different places that are offering free meals throughout the week. He gets that schedule and uh, says, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go live among homeless people until I find my son. And he tells this story of, of the day that he saw his son. He could tell just by, by his stature. And he saw his son uh, picking up a sandwich from this, this free food line. And he said this. He said, he has no idea that I'm walking towards him. He's kind of explaining his internal thoughts. He says, I can see that he can't stand up without the support of leaning on a building. And he would appear drunk to most people, but to his dad, though I know from his past experience that sadly he's just on heroin again, and it's heavy. I go up to him, and he starts to turn his back on me, but I don't even care. I just grab him, and I squeeze him as hard as I can. The story goes on, and it says, for a week. A week goes by for for longer. Frank is there with his son, and he, he said, I, I slept on the streets with him. Down by the river, I swatted rats off of him. I ate handout sandwiches with him. And a reporter, hearing this, interviewing him, said, what did you tell your son? He said, even when my son was trying to steal to buy more drugs, even whenever my son was headed to the hospital for another overdose, he said, if you die... Your dad will die with you. He became a servant to save the life of his son. And what a picture that is of the way that Christ has served us. Not that he would come and see us dead in our sin and say, I'll die with you, but that he in his glory would be humbled to become a servant and to say, I'll die for you so that you could have life in my name to take upon the sickness of your sin and to absorb the full wrath of God so that you could no longer be an orphan but a child of God the Father. And that will unify a church. 
That will change the way that you love one another. Having this deep picture of the love of Christ will become a wellspring for loving others. That's what Paul is doing here as he speaks of unity. Christ is a servant. You keep reading verse 8. It says that he was a servant to the circumcised. Well, who were the circumcised? That was, those were the Jewish people because that was uh, a part of displaying the covenant that God had made with his people. Paul wants the, the Gentiles that are, are perhaps a little bit frustrated with some of their sensitive brothers and sisters on these different matters, and they're like, man, like, I just want to eat this meat. It's not a big deal. He's saying, you know what? Christ became a servant to, the gen- to, the, to those who are circumcised, so you serve them too. And in the same way, in, in verses 9 through 12, he's going to speak to maybe the Jews or some of those with a, a more sensitive conscience. And he's going to say, hey, Christ came to redeem the Gentiles, and this has always been a part of God's plan. So set aside your preferences to pursue unity in the glory of God in the church. And in doing so, what happens? Well, we see in verse 8, the truthfulness of God is shown The promises that were given to the patriarchs, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob are confirmed in the coming of Christ, that he is indeed the hope of the Gentiles, and that he alone can provide salvation. That within the church, there would be this diverse group of people that display the glory of God. I mean, mean, think about this. Whenever you have to set aside your preferences to love one another, that kind of diversity in, in viewpoint or in matters of conscience displays the love of God and it sanctifies us, right? And it's kind of like a, a rock tumbler. You know, if you've, ever, if you've ever seen one of those, it's, it smooths out these stones that were once jagged rocks and, and they come out and they're smooth because they've just kind of, you know, con- continually pressed up against one another. They, they've been kind of in the same tumbler as it's spun. And In a lot of ways, the church is like that. You're in close relationship with people that are slightly different from you, even though you serve the same Lord, and that's a part of God's plan to sanctify you. And I think it's important for us to remember that even in our differences, God loves us all the same. No matter where you're at in your spiritual maturity level, no matter uh, where you're at in your your service and and how sacrificial you are, God, God loves you the same. I mean, I think about my own boys, and my boys are, you know, they're different. I have two sons. One is six, one is three. Uh, One has curly hair, and one has straight hair, or flat hair, as they call it. Uh, One, you know, has glasses. The other doesn't have glasses, and their personalities have differences, too. There are a lot of similarities, but one of the things that they need to know as a father is that I both love them more than their hearts could even understand. And that one of the things that brings me the most joy as a father is not just them understanding my love for them, but seeing that love reflected in the way they relate to one another. And so here Paul is saying, consider the eternal mission of God. Consider how the diversity in the church should not compromise the unity of God's people. This is seen in in a passage like Ephesians 2, 13 through 14. We read, but now in Christ Jesus... You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Right? How, how are people of, of differences, this is talking about Jew and Gentile, how do they become one? They're united in Christ. Who is Christ? Christ is the husband of the bride, and we are the church, we are the bride. In marriage, the two become one. And and in the gospel, the church is united to our husband, Christ. And we become one with him, thus becoming one with one another. Dividing wall of hostility is broken. We are united to him and inseparable from him in relationship with one another. Now, Paul doesn't want you to think that he is imposing some kind of new teaching that Jews and Gentiles are all together and, you know, a part of the one big family of God. So he's going to refer to Scripture that is made known throughout the Old Testament. He's going to give four references. And he gives these four references in a very strategic way because he is going to draw from the law, the prophets, and the writings, which is how the Old Testament during this time uh, was divided up into those three categories. And so he's going to quote from Deuteronomy, Uh, the law. He's going to quote from Isaiah, the prophets, and he's going to make two quotes from the book of Psalms, which is the writing, 
And in these four passages of Scripture, he's making the case that this has always been God's plan. This is the entire Bible's message about God's eternal mission. So the first passage that he quotes in verse 9 is from Psalm 1849. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Uh, This is also found in 2 Samuel 22. This is where uh, David is teaching the people how to praise God in the midst of victory. Now, it's interesting because they're praising God in the midst of victory, uh, which was often victory over Gentile people. And yet he's saying, praise them among the Gentiles. Now, here's the turn. Those victories often resulted in the humble surrender of Gentiles, of the nations. And here, it's as if Paul is saying, that humble surrender will not just be in defeat. The humble surrender will be in giving their heart to the Lord and in acknowledging Him as King. Next citation. Rejoice, O Gentiles, verse 10, with His people. And again, uh, verse 11 goes on. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol Him. Now, that, that second citation, verse 10, comes from Deuteronomy 32. This is from the law, and this is Moses speaking. And the interesting thing about this is he is inviting the Gentiles to praise alongside God's people. He's saying, join in God's people. Even in Moses' time. Think about that. Uh, now, now, it's also important to understand that what we read here as uh, Gentiles could also be translated as all nations. The word there is ethne. Uh, and so the translators have helped us here to kind of keep this within the context of what's happening. Uh, but we can also see that the mission is, is saying all nations here in the family of God. Verse 11, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. Now, Psalm 117 is only two verses, and so this is verse 1, but I also want you to hear verse 2. Why? Why should all nations praise the Lord God? Well, verse 2 is this, right after verse 1, for great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. And I was just thinking to myself as I read this, how often does the steadfast love of the Lord, of his mercy, of his faithfulness, prompt me to praise him as this psalm invites us to? This is ultimately what fuels our worship, is acknowledging who God is. And I love that this psalm is anonymous among uh, the, the, the entire idea of the, books, of the book of Psalms. And I think that because this psalm could have been written by anyone, it's almost as if it is also saying it can be sung by anyone. That this could be your prayer, your song. The last quotation comes from Isaiah 11.10. The root of Jesse will come, even who, he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. The root of Jesse. Who is Jesse? Well, Jesse was David's dad, right? King David. And what was the promise that was made to King David? That there would be a king who would come and rule on his throne. That he would have an eternal reign. And that he would rule in righteousness and peace. And so here... Paul is saying the root of Jesse, the one who would come from David's line, is Christ. And he arises to rule the Gentiles. They acknowledge him as king. And he supplies the Gentiles with hope. Now, isn't it amazing that we have a God who can declare the end from the beginning because he is sovereign and rules over all things? At just the right time, Christ was sent into the world to fulfill these promises. Galatians 4.4 says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Think about when Christ came historically. When Koine Greek was the most widespread language in the entire known world. Whenever there were roadways and systems of travel that had never existed up to that point, when the Pax Romana was in place and there was uh, kind of a, a general peace for the message of this gospel to spread, the fullness of time had come and Christ was sent into the world to fulfill every single promise of God. This is what Paul has been talking about since the very beginning, that he's not ashamed of this gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And that gospel creates unity within the church. This reflection on God's character creates praise in Paul's heart. And then he begins to pray for the church. 
The Roman church was evidence of God's mission, as you had people from different socioeconomic classes, people from different religious backgrounds, uh, people from different skill levels and in various areas, and they're all coming together to worship God. And he says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. To believe in Christ, the God of hope fills you with all joy and peace in believing. Joy and peace comes not from the absence of our problems, but knowing that we eternally have the presence of God with us by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Because of what Christ has done for us, we now have been reconciled to the Father to be full of of hope, to be full of joy, to be full of peace. It's interesting, the last time that this word full was used was whenever it was talking about the sinfulness of man in Romans 1, and now it is used here again to talk about the joy, peace, and hope that is filled in knowing Christ and believing in Him. Maybe maybe you just need hope this morning. Maybe you're going through some painful situation where you feel like joy is scarce and peace is fleeting. Let this passage point you to the empty tomb to encourage you that if the tomb is empty, your joy can be full, your peace can be full, your hope can be unshakenly full. And that we can relate to God as Father and one another as siblings. This eternal mission of God is what unites God's people, that He has brought us together. Paul's not pointing here to uh, modern conflict management tactics, although that might be helpful in a church where there's tension. He's not just saying, you know what? The people that you have issue with, just avoid them. Just sit on the other side of the room. Just don't be in their MC. No, he, he lifts their eyes up. And he says, look at the mission of God. Look at who your God is. Look at how he cares for you. Now care for one another in that way. That, that word that I pointed out, all nations, ethne. You see it in Matthew 28, whenever Jesus gives a great commission to his disciples. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been entrusted to me. Therefore, go. Go make disciples of all nations, pontata ethne, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What unites the church is the mission of God. Whenever the mission of God is at the forefront of our minds, we'll be walking in step together as the Holy Spirit leads us. And that's our heart whenever we think about the Roots Initiative. And what's, what's at the forefront of our mind on a day like Commitment Sunday? It, it isn't just because, man, we would really like staff offices or because we want to be able to retire our setup team. It, it's not just because we think that if we move into a permanent building, somehow that communicates that we made it. it it's because we want to zealously be a part of the eternal mission of God in whatever aspect of that He lets us be a part of it. And he says, whenever you focus on the mission of God, these these petty squabbles over non-essential matters will simply fade into the background because Christ will, will become so magnified among you that these things are minimal. The second vantage point that I want to look at is the everyday mission of God in our lives. We've seen the eternal mission of God. What does it look like? I don't know about you, but I like examples. I want to see it. Give me... Give me kind of a picture of how this is played out. I think we see that in the life of Paul. Look at verse 14. Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way down to Illyricum. I, like, literally practiced that and then messed it up right here. Isn't that funny? Oh, well, humbled. 
I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Now, we won't spend as much time on this section because Hunter will finish Romans 15 next week, and he's going to draw from this section as well. So uh, my time in this passage will be simply to make observations about being an everyday mission displayed through the life of Paul. Whenever we think about the eternal mission of God, that provides the motivation and compels us to then be sent out on mission. So uh, think of a slingshot. Now, whenever you pull a slingshot back, you, you feel the tension. You feel kind of the power that is going to happen the moment that you release it. And reflecting on the way that Christ has served us, our ultimate missionary, leaving his home to come and learn our language, live in our context, if you will, as we reflect on that, it is almost as if uh, the, our hearts are kind of being pulled back in the slingshot to then be propelled from here throughout the rest of the week to live sacrificially and intentionally as a missionary of God in our everyday lives. Now, with that being said, I also want to remind you that Paul is writing uh, to establish a base in Rome as he seeks to do mission work in Spain. Uh, Now, we have good reason to believe that he never made it to Spain, but his sending church was in Antioch throughout most of his missionary journeys, and he's writing to kind of uh, help them understand his credibility as an apostle, but also to create a home base for financial support and missionary support as he makes his way to Spain. And what we're going to find in the very first section of this passage is is that it was not just their geographical location that made them a strategic choice as a sending church, but their spiritual health. And so the first mark of a missionary that we see here is that he encourages fellow believers. He's encouraging the believers around him, saying, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Think of those three traits. I think they're evident in our church. Goodness, willingness to serve one another, but but not just action, also understanding, filled with knowledge. We love doctrine, but not for the sake of just puffing ourselves up, but because we love the Lord and we want to know a lot about Him. And I I love my wife. I want to know more and more about her than I, than I do after being married for 11 years. We love the Lord. We want to, we want to be full of knowledge. At, at the same time, it's to instruct one another, right? He says, you are passing on the truth that you know. You're, you're teaching these things practically in, in time management and in matters of marriage and parenting and how to live as a missionary in the workplace. You're instructing one another. You're making disciples, I'm excited because I see that in our church. And so I want to apply this. I'm encouraging you. I know it's not easy. I know it's countercultural, but I see Christ in you. I'm excited about that. Second, speak the truth with boldness. He, he says in, in verse 15, on some points I've written to you very boldly. By way of reminder, I'm not telling you something that you didn't already know, but I'm speaking to you very boldly on some points because of the grace that's been given to me as a minister of the gospel. He speaks boldly about sin. He speaks boldly about our need to repent and to trust Christ with all of our being. He speaks boldly in Romans 7 about his own struggle with sin. He's not saying that he's perfect. He speaks boldly addressing issues of tension within the church. But he speaks boldly with truth and grace for the good of others. We need to speak truth to others. We need to speak boldly. But let's be honest. The person that we need to speak most boldly to on a daily basis is ourselves. Man, we got to make a habit of preaching the gospel to ourselves. Speak boldly the truth. Know the truth so you can speak it. Third, minister from God's grace. Let me remind you that what God has called you to, he will equip you for. And maybe some things that you're writing on that personal growing gospel roots, you're like, I'm, man, I just, I feel like I'm called to this and I don't really know. Maybe you're serving right now and you feel like you are serving uh, in, in a way that is stretching the capacity of what you have to give. And, and what do we see Paul saying right at the very end of verse 15? His calling is based upon the grace that is given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Parents in the home, grandparents are still trying to, you know, help alongside your, your adult children. 
serving in some capacity in our church, missional community, leadership, sacrificially giving of your time to, to your roommates and those around you? What makes you fit for that role? It is only the grace given to God. Is, is Paul perhaps reflecting on his saving grace? Yes, but I think even more so he is focusing on serving grace, that the Lord will supply all that you need to do what he has called you to do. Fourth trait, fourth mark, give praise to the Lord for the work that he accomplishes. Look at verse 17. There's these two bookends, in Christ Jesus and for God. Now, what's said in between those? He says, in Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. We say, wait, 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 Paul, you're proud? Like, don't, like, prideful is terrible. Like, what are you doing, Paul? You say, no, in Christ Jesus. Is it only Christ is doing this stuff in and through me? They say, and, and my motivation for doing it all is for God. And because of that, I'm, I'm proud of what I see God doing. I give him all the praise for it. He continues his thought in verse 18 just to clarify perhaps a little bit. He says, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. He says that he, he's bringing the Gentiles to faith in Christ. Now, if you picked up on what he said in verse 16, he's using this analogy, this illustration, if you will, of priestly service. Now, in the Old Testament, the priest's job was to bring sacrifices to the Lord on behalf of the people. And, and Paul here is kind of turning this, viewing it with a new covenant lens, and he's saying, I'm not bringing sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. I'm bringing the Gentiles to faith in God for his glory. And so he's saying, I'm not, I'm not going to boast on any, boast in anything except for what Christ has accomplished in me. And, and that's my prayer for our church. The story of the Oaks is not about the Oaks. It's about God. Far be it from us to boast in anything that we think we might have had our hand in. May our vision, may the prayers that we put on those cards be so big that they would absolutely fail if it was not for the faithfulness of God and the work of the Spirit. Fifth and finally, have an ambitious vision for sharing the gospel. You know that most scholars think that Paul was probably around 60 years old whenever he's writing this, and he's saying, I'm going to Spain, right? I'm, I'm not going to preach the gospel anywhere else that it's been named. He's 60. He's probably going to have to learn Latin to be able to continue to do this ministry. He's going to go to a place where he doesn't know anybody. It's like, Paul, man, might be a good time to think about retirement, but he's, he's got this ambitious view of the gospel. Why? Because he has a God-given calling, he says, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. Now, that's not a requirement to be faithful in ministry. We know that uh, because that was Paul's strategy. That was Paul's unique calling. He, he didn't want to go where the gospel had already been named. But what does he do with his, his guys that he was mentoring, his apprentices? He sends Timothy and Titus to places where he had already done work to, to build up ministries that were there. Now, here's the most interesting thing that I found in verse 19 that he says that he has fulfilled the ministry of, gospel, of the gospel in these places. And you're like, how can you say that? Is there like a certain number of Christians that come to faith that like, okay, now it's fulfilled? Is it that, you know, there's a percentage of the population that has come to faith in Christ and now you can say it's fulfilled? No. What did he do in every single one of those places? He started a church. He preached the gospel faithfully. People gave their lives to Christ. He gathered them together in a community he raised up leaders that became elders. People were brought into, into the place of deacons. A community was formed. They committed together. A church was established. And then he went on. What does it look like for us to have a heart that desires to fulfill the ministry of God wherever he's called us to? What does it look like for us to support and to pray for churches in our city? To be a church that is faithful, that we would fulfill our ministry to plant other faithful churches around the world to fulfill the ministry that God has entrusted to us. On Wednesday, a couple of us are leaving to go and see some of our mission partners in an international place. We want to pray for them. We want to serve them. They're doing hard work, but they're, they're fulfilling the ministry of God. It's my prayer that some of you that are sitting here right now, some of the guys that we've already sent to seminary, would say, you know what, I feel like God's put a burden on my heart for this city, for this people, and 
I want to fulfill the ministry of God. Maybe you'd say, I want to be a part of a church planting team that would plant in our city, plant another faithful church, plant in our state, plant in our, our country, plant in our world to fulfill the ministry of God. If you are here at the Oaks, you are a part of God's plan for fulfilling his ministry in this city. Guys, we're still a church plant. Like, I don't know how long you can claim that, but I'm claiming it, all right? Because here's the deal. Statistically, most churches, the average age of the church after 2,000 churches were surveyed, the average age of a church is 92 years old, all right? We're seven, so we're like just learned to read, haven't started multiplication yet, you know, like that's, that's where we're at, okay? But think about, man, if, if God, if, if Christ doesn't return, if we have 92 years, Lord willing, in the life of our church, think about just what it means for you to be in year seven. Even if, even if you're here as a college student or even if God moves you somewhere else, man, if you're serving here, if you're intentionally loving other people here, if you're investing here, if you're building relationships here, if you're sharing the gospel with your neighbor in your neighborhood at your workplace, you're fulfilling the ministry that God has called you to and the mission of this church. And what grounds our sacrifice? What motivates us? It is this passage in Isaiah 52, 15. I think that's why Paul quotes it. It comes from that section of Isaiah where the suffering servant is mentioned. In verse 15, it says, Those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. I wish I had time to go into all of Isaiah 52. But, but what you need to know is that this is where it talks about he who would be marred beyond recognition. He who would suffer to the point of death in our place so that those who had never heard would hear and so that those who never saw the goodness of God would see it in the face of Christ. It is God's act of redemption as the suffering servant that cleanses the nations and draws us to himself. It is this eternal mission of God that calls us out of our comfort and control to live on everyday mission with God. So let me ask, do you know God as Father? Have you surrendered to Christ? Have you experienced His servant love toward you? Maybe in, in the stillness of this room and in the quietness of your own heart, you'd make that decision today. For others, is it just a prayer of, of renewed zeal for this mission? You know these truths. They're not new to you. But as Paul said, by way of reminder, that we would by way of reminder be reminded of the grace that not only saves us, but also equips us to serve. What does it look like intentionally in your home, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in this body of believers? And I love that so much of this centers around unity. Why does unity in the church matter so much? Because it is evidence of God's grace and it is a foretaste of the eternal mission of God fulfilled throughout eternity. What does John say as he ultimately sees this mission fulfilled as we one day will? Revelation 7, 9 through 12. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. May this day that is soon to come help you live this day that we are presently in, that God's eternal mission has granted us eternal life. Let's pray.